morning, everyone. How are you? Well, you good? Good, good. Hey, I want to do our Bible study time here in a moment. But before we do that, I want to introduce my friend, Ryan Cochran. Ryan serves with us here at the church on our... <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> That's right. Uh, but Ryan serves with us here at the church on our prayer team. And I asked him if he wouldn't come out um, and pray with us and for us as a community. Uh, the news this week of Acorn closing has impacted a lot of people here um, in the church for sure, but um, and in our community. And so I just asked Ryan to just lead us in a prayer for that, those people that are going to be looking for, for new jobs, etc. So um, Ryan, pray for us, would you? God, we just thank you for today, Lord. And Lord, some people's hearts are heavy, God, because of this. And we just ask, Lord, that you would just bless these people, God. All the people involved, the friends, the family, Lord. We pray that you would just bless them, Lord God, with that, um, that weight, Lord, being lifted from their lives. Um, we pray that you give them wisdom, God, to know what to do, Lord. And I really ask most of all, Lord, that they would know that you care for them, God. Sometimes we forget how much you care, Lord. And sometimes situations like this make us either remember or get afraid, Lord. And I just pray they wouldn't get afraid, God. We pray that we could come alongside them and just help them, Lord God. Give them wisdom and insight, Lord. Um, but more than that, just that we care too. And so we just pray, Lord, as all this transpires in the next few months, God, that people wouldn't be rushed they wouldn't be anxious, Lord God, and that we could just be at peace um, as a people, God. Um, we love what you're doing, Lord God, here, God, but we know that it's bigger than just Renaissance, Lord. We know that it's bigger um, than even just Decatur, God. And um, I'm just reminded, Lord, of what's happening, Lord, in, in the country, Lord, like with the Asbury revival, some people would call it that. Um, God, that all of these things are connected, God. We, we may not see that they're connected, Lord. And sometimes we get bogged down in the troubles of life. But, Lord, we just pray, Lord, that we could see clearly, um, especially to help these people, Lord, that are going through uh, these troubles, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You agree? Amen. Well done, young man. Everybody give that vest a hand. How about that vest, Ryan? Ryan's, Ryan's married now and his wife bought him a vest and he's not a vest guy, but I think it looks awesome on him, don't you think? So well done, buddy. Um, well, good morning, everyone. My name is Jeff. I'm one of the pastors here and I'm gonna lead our time of Bible study. If you have a Bible with you, I'm gonna ask you to open it and turn to Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter three, chapter four. We're gonna be right in between those two places. If you don't have a Bible with you, there's one underneath the seat probably close to you. If you look underneath, there's a black hardback Bible. You're welcome to use that if you'd like. And if you don't own a Bible, you're welcome to take that Bible home with you. We'd like to give it to you as a gift and we'll put more Bibles in the chairs for you. But you can follow along um, in your Bibles or you could follow along on the words in the with the words behind me when I read them. But before we get there, I just want to do a little bit of work um, talking about what the Bible is. If, if you didn't grow up in church, the Bible's a strange thing. We call it a book, but it's actually not one book singular. It's actually a collection of 66 individual books within one binding. So it's actually, the word Bible is actually means library or books. And so in your Bible, there are a bunch of books in the Old Testament. How many people have heard of the Old Testament, right? And there's a bunch of books in the New Testament. Yes, try not to interrupt. I don't come to your work and interrupt you. I'm just saying. <laughs> but you are right. There are 39 books. Thank you for that. That's so good. Because honestly, I wanted to say that and I forgot. It's 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 books in the New Testament. And if you add that together, and if you didn't go to Warrensburg, you'll come up with 66. <laughs> 66 books in the Bible there. 
Um, but anyways, but the Old Testament and the New Testament, it's easy for us to see that sort of demarcation line between the two and as if they're somehow separated from one another. I mean, heck, they have their own names, Old Testament and New Testament. But they're actually connected. They're connected in more ways than we possibly could even imagine. And um, St. Augustine said this years and years and years ago, the great church father, St. Augustine, he said this, that the new is the old concealed and the old is the new revealed. Let me read that again, adding a few words to make more sense for you. But the New Testament is in the Old Testament, but it's concealed. Like there are things in the Old Testament that you can't even see them or understand them without having read the New Testament. And then he continues to say, and that the Old Testament is revealed by the New Testament. So there are things in the Old Testament you won't understand with the, without the New, and there are things in the New that you won't fully have understanding without having read the Old. Um, uh, when I was a young Christian, some people would say things to me like they never read the Old Testament because, you know, Jesus isn't even mentioned there. I just read the Gospels in the New Testament, and I just want to study about Jesus in, the, in, in all the New Testament. And I'll just tell you, if you really want to understand Jesus better, you have to spend time in the Old Testament. There's just a lot of things that are sort of hidden, quote unquote, in the Old Testament that point to Jesus in the New Testament. Let me give you a great example. So in the Old Testament, we have this sacrificial system that God instituted for his people, where if they were to sin against him, they could bring a lamb as a sacrifice or another animal, sometimes a goat, sometimes a pigeon, depending on how much money you had. But you could bring an animal, an innocent animal, and sacrifice that animal to atone for your sins. And this lamb of God is, is sacrificed to atone for your sins. Now, we fast forward into the New Testament and we see that John the baptizer sees Jesus walking by one day and calls him the lamb of God. Now, that's an interesting thing to call somebody, you know, a, an animal name. I have a lot of animal names for some of my friends too. I can't say them here, but you know what I'm saying. But, but to call him a lamb of God seems strange, unless you knew what the lamb meant in the Old Testament. And it points to this reality that, that the lambs are typically sacrificed to atone for the sins of the people. And when Jesus walks by, John doesn't just, does, doesn't just say, hey, look, there goes a lamb, but he says, there goes the lamb of God. Like God is offering a sacrifice that will be once and for all for his people, and that is Jesus Christ. Is this making sense? And there's all kinds of allusions to Jesus in the Old Testament. You have the story of Abraham and Isaac. Abraham was, was asked by God to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, right? It's a crazy, bizarre story. And so Abraham takes his son up to this mountain. He's getting ready to sacrifice his son, and God tells him to stop. And he goes, and I'll provide a sacrifice for you, Abraham. And he looks over in the, the bushes and there's a ram caught in the bush. Well, who is the ram? Jesus is the answer. The answer is always Jesus here at the church here. So, but see, there's a picture that, that God is going to provide a sacrifice for the son that's due to die. God intervenes on his behalf and says, I'll provide the sacrifice. I'll do this for you. So all that to say that there are a lot of things that we see in the Old Testament that have great influence in the new and vice versa. And it helps us to see the pictures and the stories that the, the New Testament writers are telling us in more color is the wrong word, but it's like, it helps us to get a fuller understanding. It's like seeing it in 3D. You get a different vantage point. Is this making sense? And I'm setting all of that up because today we're going to read something from Luke that means a lot to us, but I would argue it would mean more to us if we understood the Old Testament too. So that being said, I want to read something from Luke chapter 3, verse 23, and this will be the start of our passage. This is Luke telling us when Jesus was beginning his ministry. So just pause real quick. Jesus uh, at age 12 was left at the temple with his parents. They finally find him at the temple. They go back to Nazareth where for the next 18 years, Jesus grows up in obscurity. We hear nothing about Jesus' life until he comes out of Nazareth into the Judean desert to be baptized by John the Baptist. And then he starts his ministry. And this is where Luke picks us up. 
Verse 23, it says this, that Jesus, when he began his ministry, he was about 30 years of age. So people have always wondered, how, do we, how old was Jesus when he started? Well, we know right here, Luke tells us. He was about 30 years of age. We don't know exactly, but it's close enough. Wouldn't you agree? And he was the son, parentheses, as Luke tells us, or as supposed, was supposed of Joseph, Joseph and Mary, right? And Joseph was the son of Heli, who was the son of someone, who was the son of someone. For the next 10 verses, you can read all of that on your own. But when I read it, I feel like I'm reading the Hebrew phone book. So I'm not gonna do it for you. So we're just gonna skip down to verse 38, where Luke continues the genealogy. And he says this, that he was the son of Enos, who was the son of Seth. Again, this is all the lineage of Jesus, who was the son of Adam. Remember Adam and Eve. And then Luke adds this language, who was the son of God. That Luke is telling us that Adam was the son of God. And so he takes us back to this genealogy of Jesus and his genealogy is a little different than Matthew's genealogy. If you were to read Matthew's gospel, Matthew's gospel takes his genealogy just back to Abraham, which is fine. Matthew's writing to Jewish audiences. He's, he's trying to prove to them that Jesus is the Messiah of the Jewish people. But Luke, writing to Gentiles, he takes his ge genealogy all the way back to the beginning of creation when God created Adam and Eve, and Adam was a son of God. Jesus is connected to Adam, the son of God. So Adam's the son of God. Let me go back up to verse 21 of chapter 3. We're going to tie this together, and it'll make sense hopefully in a moment. It says, when all of the people were baptized, so Jesus waits till all the people were baptized, and then he goes out to be baptized. And it says that he was praying, verse 21, verse 22, and it says in the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, descends on Jesus in bodily form, kind of like a dove, looks like a bird of some sort, which is strange, doesn't matter, but the Holy Spirit is there, Jesus is there praying. And then it says, a voice came from heaven saying these words, and you've heard these words before. This is God speaking over his son, Jesus. You are my beloved son, and with you I am well pleased. Now, just side note, we are Trinitarians. It just means this. We believe that, that God manifests or is a triune God. He is the Father, he is the Son, he is the Holy Spirit. We do, we do not believe that he is one God who manifests in three different like personalities or three different things. He doesn't, he's not like a shapeshifter that he shapeshifts into Jesus and then back over to the Spirit of God. But we believe in three unique individuals, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, and they are all three together God. Is this making sense? It's bizarro, I know, but that's what we believe. And we believe so because of passages like this where we see Jesus, the Son of God, in the river praying to God, the Spirit of God coming down to individuals, and then a voice from the Father God speaking to them. All three people are participating in this event. Are you guys tracking with me? But the language again is this, as he says, you are my son. So Jesus also is a son of God. Okay, if you can see what Luke is trying to stitch together for us, that he's telling us that Adam way back in the beginning was a son of God, and now Jesus also is a son of God. There is some comparisons between the two. If you know the story of Genesis chapter one, two, and three, God created everything. He created the heavens and the earth, the trees, the birds, the cows, the bacon, the pigs. I mean, he creates all the good stuff, right? And then he places mankind in, a, in it, in his image. He says, I want you to reflect my image and my glory on the earth, tend it and keep it. And they did so. And then at some point, sin entered into the world. A deceiver, a tempter, a serpent, Satan, the devil, comes to Adam and Eve and gets them to distrust God long enough to disobey him. And in their disobedience to God, sin enters into the world and the good and perfectness of God and his creation is shattered and broken. And he curses the serpent and he exiles Adam and Eve. But before he does so, he says, but I'm going to send another one, the seed of a woman, another son will come and he will reconcile all of this. And we fast forward into the New Testament from the Old Testament story of creation and we see the birth of Jesus, the baptism of Jesus and the voice of God saying, this is my son the one made in my image. And we, we automatically hyperlink back to the beginning when God created something that broke because of mankind's sinfulness. And Jesus is now introduced to us 
as if to say, God is re, are you, track with me here. I'm recreating this place and I'm doing so through another son of mine. Are you hear, hearing what I'm saying? That Jesus is a son of God. In fact, um, the apostle Paul picks up on this language from the Old Testament and the New Testament, and he actually gives Jesus the name, the second or the last Adam. Has anybody ever heard that before? So we have the first Adam in creation made in the image of God, but he fails when he was tested and he was tempted. And the new son of God, Jesus, the last Adam is about to embark on a testing from the devil. And these two parallels, and it's so awesome. Are you catching this? Are you, tell me yes, tell me the truth, don't lie to me. I think he's catching it. This is amazing. And so there's something that God is trying to tell us through the story of Luke that we're going to see when Jesus is tempted in the desert. Let's move on to chapter four, verse one. And it says that Jesus, who is now full of the Holy Spirit, he just got baptized, right? This whole cool, the sky's open. The voice of God comes out, says, you're my son, I love you. And immediately after this moment, Jesus is led full of the Holy Spirit. He returns from the Jordan. He is led by the spirit into the wilderness for 40 days, chapter or verse two says. And he goes out there to be tempted by the devil. And it says that he ate nothing during those days. And when the, those days ended, he was hungry. It's an understatement, wouldn't you agree? After 40 days, I get hungry if I miss lunch, I'm just saying. Verse three, and the devil said, if you are the son of God. Let's just assume for a moment that the, when the voice from heaven cried out, it was true. Let's say you are the son of God. Then command these stones to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written that man shall not live by bread alone. This is a famous passage, right? But do you see the connection now between the two? That Adam created in the image of God, the son of God was, was tempted by the devil and he failed. And now Luke is telling us about another Adam who gets tempted by the devil. And our tension, like if we're watching this on DVD, we're wondering, oh my gosh, is he going to fail like the first one did? Is, is this thing gonna have to start all over again? Are we gonna reread the entire story, history one more time? But we don't see that. Jesus does something unique and different. Something that I would argue only the son of God could do. So a couple of things, first off, it, he was led by the spirit to be tempted by the devil. Um, I think two things stand out to us. First, it's this, this is not happening by accident. Okay, this is an intentional thing that God does for his sons and his daughters. Nobody wants to hear that, but God oftentimes will take us to a place for testing. You hearing me? And he does so intentionally. And he does so because he entrusts us to make the right decision when we're tested, when we're tempted by the devil, that God allows these things to oftentimes happen to us. They're sometimes intentional. So it's not an accident. This is what God is doing. And this is not based on anything that Jesus has done. This is truly something that God is trying to do. You following me? Anyways, and the devil says to him, well, if you are the son of God, then turn these stones into bread. Pause. Right now, we know Jesus could do the very thing that the devil is trying to persuade him to do. He 100% could do this. But the real question is, is he going to fail? Is he going to choose his own way or is he going to continue to follow after God and do the things that God wants him to do? And so Jesus, what I love is he quotes Old Testament scriptures, again, tying the New Testament and the Old Testament together. He quotes something out of Deuteronomy chapter eight. I won't give it to you, but it's extra credit for you. And Jesus says that man shall not live by bread alone. Matthew's story of this same situation tells us that Jesus also continues that, that quote in Deuteronomy and says this, not only should man live by Man shall not live by bread alone, but he should live by every word that comes out of the mouth of the Lord. And so here it is. Somebody's lying here. Is it God? Or is it the devil? It's the devil. It's Satan, the accuser, the liar. It, everything he says is a lie to us. And so we learned that Jesus was able to do something that Adam, the first Adam, couldn't do. He was not tempted because he believed in God's voice. He believed in the words of God. 
So he passes test numero uno, and there's three tests. We'll go th through them quickly. That first one was bread. This one is about worship or bowing down before the devil. Verse five, and it says, and the devil then took Jesus up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Okay, that's just bizarro language, isn't it? Like, what do you mean he took him up? They go like into some like spaceship type thing and up and you saw the entire, we don't know. Luke doesn't tell us really how this thing happened. We don't know exactly how it happened. We just know this, that the devil somehow takes Jesus and shows him all of the kingdoms of the world at once, at one time. And then he says these words to him, to you, Jesus, I will give you all of this authority and all of its glory because it has been delivered over to me and I can give it to whomever I will. So Satan is telling Jesus that I actually have authority over this realm. And I would not argue with that. We see that when mankind gave itself over to sin, that sin began to rule the earth and the devil's behind sin for sure. And so the devil, Satan has the reign of this earth. And he says it's been given to him. That's a strange theological idea to consider. We'll have to jump on that another day. Just know this, that he knows it's been given to him. He has certain authorities and he can, should he choose, give it to someone else. And he's offering it to the second Adam. He's offering it to Jesus, the son of God, if he'll do one thing for him. And guess what this is? Keep reading. He says, if, verse seven, you will bow down or if you will worship me. All of this could be yours. And there's a temptation right there. But Jesus answers him, again, quoting scripture, quoting Deuteronomy chapter six, I believe. I'm not giving these to you. These are all homework if you'd like them. But Jesus quotes the Bible and just says this, that you shall not worship, or sorry, Jesus answers and says, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Um, I was praying this morning and my mind went to Matthew chapter 28. This, I'm so sorry to give you this extra stuff, but this is how it clicked for me. Um, in Matthew 28, it's the end of Matthew's gospel. Jesus had been crucified, buried in a grave. He's raised from the dead. Hallelujah. Happy Easter, everyone. And then he's with his disciples for like 40 days or so. And before he returns back to heaven from when she came, he sits with his disciples and begins to tell them some things. And what he does in Matthew 28 is he gives them what we call the great commission. He tells them, I want you to take this message about me as the son of God, the new Adam who's recreating the world. The kingdom of God is at hand. All of this beautiful stuff, right? And he says these words in Matthew 28, verse 18. He says, all authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. The devil is trying to give Jesus what he's already going to receive. He's trying to give it to him through a different way. The way of God is the way of the cross. The way of God is to do something that no one else can do. The way of God is for him to be the lamb slain before the foundation of the earth so that all humanity can be freed from the clutches of sin and death. Or he can do it the devil's way. Just quickly say, sure, why not? This seems like the easy thing to do. And he receives the same stuff. He receives authority and all the glory of the earth. He can get it by bowing down to Satan or he can do it by following the will of God. If I had a desire this morning, it is for you to understand what Jesus Christ has done for us and that it would, it would move us to a place of praise and adoration, that he succeeded if you had the opportunity to get everything that you're going to get anyways and to get it an easier way, wouldn't you take the easier way? Wouldn't I? Sometimes the answer is yes, but many times what God is calling us into is harder. It feels like dying. It feels like, but, but Lord, but if I go this, it'd be so much easier if I, just, if I just let them do that to me or if I just enter into that agreement with them or whatever. But the Lord sometimes is telling us, listen, you're going to get it a different way. And I need your will to be transformed, that you, you are motivated by your own desires more than mine sometimes. And here's what needs to happen, Jeff. That's how the Lord talks to me sometimes. 
My nickname is Fro. Sometimes the Lord calls me Fro. It's a very strange thing, but it's a true thing. But he'll speak to me. He's like, Jeff, you can have all this, but Jeff, you are selfish. I need your pride to die a little bit. Jeff, you are this. You, you have made all of these great plans, but Jeff, you've never asked me if this is what I want for you. Is this, is this resonating with anyone? Am I the only honest person in the room? That's totally fine. Lord, you see all these liars out here. <laughs> you deal with them. I ain't got time to deal with all these people. They belong to you anyways. I'm just, I'm just the guy with the keys. I don't know why I just opened the building up. No, listen, that's what we do. Is that sometimes we choose the shortcut, the easier thing, the plan that we've come up with, maybe even the plan that the devil has enticed us into instead of the ways of God. But Jesus, the son of God, the second Adam, the one who's recreating all of the goodness on the earth through his sacrifice, he didn't fail. He succeeded. He succeeded where Adam couldn't, and he succeeded sometimes where you and I couldn't. And again, this should draw our praise. Like praise should just leave our lips when we think about the work that Jesus has done because he followed the way of God, because he went to the cross, because he was buried and raised on the third day, we have the hope of new life. We have the power of the Holy Spirit given to us because of what Jesus performs here, our lives are radically changed. Is anyone getting this? Lord, help. Bread, Worship, bow down, and lastly, this last um, temptation. I call it the bungee jump. It just, it's, well, you'll see. Verse 9, it says this, that the devil then takes Jesus now to Jerusalem in some sort of mystery vehicle of sorts. I don't know how this happens. And he takes him to Jerusalem, and he sets Jesus on the pinnacle or the top of the temple overlooking the Kidron Valley there. It's a very high point of the temple. And he says, again, if, as they say, you are the son of God, well, then just throw yourself down from the temple in front of all of these witnesses, inferred, right? In front of all these people, for it is written, and then I love this, the, the devil quotes scripture, right? Jesus has done it twice. He's like, oh yeah, I can quote scripture, watch this. And so he says this, that the Bible says this, that, that he, meaning God, will command his angels concerning you, Jesus, and he'll guard you. And on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. He's saying that the Old Testament book of Psalms, which is what he's quoting, Psalm 91, he says that of the Messiah, that the Messiah will be cared for by angels and that he won't allow anything to happen to him. And, and, and the devil is trying to misquote the scripture to say, listen, just throw yourself off the temple and watch. We'll see these mysterious beings, supernatural beings come down from heaven and save you. It'll be cool. It'll be like 4th of July all over again. We'll see this whole thing happen in front of everyone. And then everyone will know that you're the son of God. And Jesus rebukes him. Verse 12, he says, no. And he answers him. It is said that you shall not put the Lord, your God, to the test. Again, Jesus is quoting Deuteronomy chapter 6. If you want homework, Deuteronomy chapter 6. The Faith Life Study Bible had this to say about this verse. Verse 10, it says, The devil quotes Psalm 91, verses 11 and 12, and he does so perhaps mocking Jesus' use of Scripture. Maybe. Both lines of this psalm are taken out of context. This psalm clearly is not about angels protecting people who jump off of buildings. Amen. Rather, the sense is that Yahweh's protection, right? God's protection is so near and careful that his angels could even stop people from hurting their feet while walking. That's what this Psalm is really saying. And the, the devil just misquoted, misunderstood it, was twisting scripture, which is really what the, the devil does sometimes, is he twists scripture so that we can't have a full understanding. So this is an awful lot. I'm, I'm winding down here. Um, we see three temptations, three tests that come before Jesus, the second Adam, and he passes all of them. Someone say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes. I didn't believe you. That's fine. Uh, we say hallelujah to that because we're so thankful for that. And, and here's what we do because of that. We praise him. 
again, if I had one thing, if I could just, like, if I could make people say things with their lips, that it would be praise to Jesus. If I could just make their hearts be transformed, I would make them fall in love with Jesus. I can't do that. But stories like this in the Bible with the power of the Holy Spirit, it begins to untie your, your sense of self guidance and self you know, like you're in charge of yourself and, and you begin to understand that God is actually leading you into something that's greater than yourself. And he does so through Jesus. And if we have that understanding, then praise should just come from us. So when we gather in a church on Sunday, we should be people who praise him. We were singing songs earlier and many of us were just lifting our voices, praising him. Behold the lamb of God. Behold, we're singing these songs about him. I wish we could all do that. And with a greater understanding of that, we will. Jesus was the Adam that passed the test. And so we praise him. Secondarily, we see all of this. Read this in verse 13. That when the devil had ended all of these temptations against Jesus, that the devil departed from him until an opportune time came that he would come back. And so Jesus, it says, he returned in the power of the Holy Spirit back to Galilee. He started his ministry. And reports of Jesus went all through the surrounding country. In verse 15, it says that Jesus began to teach in their synagogues. And it says that he was being glorified by all the people. Like they understood that Jesus as the last Adam is coming to do something unique and special in their lives. And they begin to praise him. And I just wanna remind us that we, the Bible would call us, that we believers, that we too are sons and daughters of God. And so when we read the story of the son of God passing the test when temptation comes and you find yourself, man, I just, I can never seem to, <laughs> I have a quote, let me give this to you. Uh, it's from Oscar Wilde. It says this, I can resist everything except temptation. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Oscar Wilde's in that, I'm just saying. I can resist everything except temptation. Sometimes that feels like our lives. Let me just tell you, Oscar Wilde was not a believer because believers would never say that. Because what Jesus has done for us on the cross and through his resurrection and giving his Holy Spirit to us, we now have a new nature. Our nature is now, it's not driven by sinful things. It's driven by the heart of God that we too, as sons and daughters, we become image bearers of who God is. So all of the stuff that was promised to Adam to reflect God's glory in the earth belongs to us. All of the, the um, things that Jesus had available to him through the power of the Holy Spirit, that he also was an image bearer of God, reflecting his glory on the earth, walking in God's ways, following his will has been given to us. We as sons and daughters have that same inheritance available to us that that Jesus had. And so, as Oscar, Oscar Wilde says, when temptation comes towards us, we can, we can pass the test. Paul writes in, in Corinthians, I don't remember which one, first or second Corinthians, but he just says this, when temptation comes your way, listen to me, God has provided a way of escape for you. You just have to go that way instead. When I was a young Christian, this was my life verse. Anybody know what life verse is? Like as a young Christian, I just felt like I was constantly getting tempted to do the old things that I used to do. And God always brought me back to that verse says, Jeff, you idiot, you have another way. You just refuse to walk in it. Here's what I want. I want you to walk in the other way. For some of you, you are believers, you, you are Christian. We don't doubt that. We see the fruit of the Spirit in your life, the Holy Spirit operating in your life. And yet, sometimes you still struggle with some things. Hear, hear these words. When temptation or testing comes, I want you to hear this. God is entrusting you to make the right decision. And he's given you the way to do it. He's empowered you by the Holy Spirit and you can walk a different path. I say that prophetically over your lives. I say that with intention, that you have more inside of you than you could possibly imagine. Your life on this earth can look different. You have to choose. The second group of people would be people here that, who, who aren't believers. 
you, you, you haven't really surrendered your life to Jesus. You haven't done it yet. You're still trying to come to this conclusion of whether Jesus is who he says he is and all of that. My prayer for you then is that the Holy Spirit would, would bring some conviction to you and that you would realize I've got to change. Like I've tried this on my own. I've white knuckled it is what we say through my entire life and I can never make a different decision. It's like I am clutched in a trap of sin. It's like I can't even make the right decisions. And that is exactly the language that the Apostle Paul uses, that we are bound in sin. It has enslaved us like a wicked taskmaster. But through Jesus Christ, you can be made new and you can have a different life. And for, for some people in the room, you just need to make that surrender. You just need to make that choice. I'm going to give my life to Jesus. So I'll close with this, with a prayer. I just wanna pray for us. I wanna pray for people who are believers and have just, they just need re-encouraged on the, the power that they have through the Holy Spirit. This year, I've been praying for not, for not many things more than I want to say this is the only thing I'm praying for. I'm praying for the power of God to be manifest in his church. I want it in Renaissance. I'll take it wherever it comes. Sounds like Asbury's having some pretty good times down there, whatever that is, if you know what's going on there. But I'm asking that God would show up in power for his church. And to do so, believers need to have a greater understanding of their new identity. They need to have their minds renewed and transformed into this truth and reality. They need to know that Jesus Christ beat back the devil and you can too. And secondarily, we need people to fall in love with Jesus for the first time and become Christians. And we need more sons and daughters in the kingdom. Amen. That's what we need. That's why I'm here. That's why, that's why I put on pants this morning. So uh, um, you're welcome for that. <laughs> so let's, let's pray together, shall we? Father, we ask for your Holy Spirit. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would come and that you would quicken this room, that you would move up and down the aisles in between the seats, Lord, and you would begin to speak to your people. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for coming. Convince us of another way. Convince us in, in more trust in Jesus. Convince us of the way of God through Jesus Christ, that it's a better way than we have for ourselves. Holy Spirit, I pray that you quicken our tongues for praise and worship, that we not be a people who merely are entertained by what comes from the platform and the music that comes from the speakers, Lord, but we would actually engage with it, that we would join the, the chorus of other believers across the globe who laud the name Jesus Christ and exalt the name of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, that we would join the chorus of angels that cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, that we would join with eternity, Lord God, and give you all the praise that you deserve. If nothing else, Lord God, open our eyes to this reality that you are worth it to be praised. That we need something within us to change, Lord God. That we need to be undignified in our worship and to not worry about what the person sitting next to us thinks or, or anything. But we need to go before you, the audience of one, and, and give you the praise that you so richly deserve. God, Holy Spirit, that you would come and create in us a, a worshiping church. Create in us a worshiping heart. Create in us a desire to, to, to give you what you're worth, Lord. As we prayed earlier for our city and our community, may and my, I parrot what Ryan had said for us, that we would know, God, that you care for us that the, the metaphor of a father and a son or a father and a daughter, it, it speaks to an intimacy in relationship. It speaks to provision and it speaks to care in a way that a good and loving father loves his children. And so help us to, to sense that, Lord. Father, we thank you. We worship you, Lord and we give you praise. And everyone says, amen, amen, amen. God bless you.